The Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Ott. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from Sufi Thought and Action by Idris Shah. This audio is made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. Theories, Practices and Training Systems of a Sufi School by Canon W. H. T. Gardner Note, this was originally published as The Way of a Mohammedan Mystic in Muslim World 2, 1912. Theories, Practices and Training Systems of a Sufi School The Sufis are the mystics of Islam, and Sufism is, historically, the mystical side of Mohammedanism. Originally, it was a mere protest against the worldliness and irreligiousness which material success had imported into Islam, and consisted in little more than an insistence on and a multiplication of religious exercises with a view to drawing nearer unto Allah. Later on, as the connection between Islam and the Middle East became more and more important, and Christian, Persian and Indian mystical influences sought admission to the world of Muslim thought, it was the Sufis who mainly opened to them the door, and, through the natural affinity of the mystically minded all the world over, afforded a home to the new ideas. Under their influence, Mohammedan mysticism became more doctrinal and systematic, and in part more esoteric. Its tenets, its methods and its ritual became alike more elaborate, and its consistency with the Sunnite system of theology and practice became for a time open to question. To two men, more than any other, El Kusheri and El Ghazali, Islam owes the standardizing of Sufism in its relation to Sunnite orthodoxy. They, in the first place, gave it, for good and all, a distinct locus standi in Islam, and by precept and example showed how far it could go without slipping into pantheism and becoming a mere esoteric Gnosticism or theosophy within the Islamic community. It may, however, be asserted with some confidence that, both before and after the era of these men, there was an extreme left in Sufism, which did, unconsciously or perhaps consciously, tremble on the line or slip over it, men for whom the Gnostic and theosophical influences which were existent in the early days of Islam not less than they were in the days before and after the birth of Christianity, proved too strong. But it would always have been very difficult to distinguish this left wing from the left centre, and next to impossible to draw a line separating the two, the fact being that most of those who were nearest that line would have been wholly unable to define their own position while those who were aware that they had passed beyond it would keep the fact entirely to themselves. And such, it may be hazarded, is still the case. Sufism today also has its left, its centre and its right. But the left wing is not the typical group. That is the important thing to remember. The object of this paper, however, is by no means to give a history of, or to write an essay on, Sufism. For that, we must wait for Dr. Nicholson's forthcoming history of Sufism, which all Orientalists are awaiting with so much interest. The object of the present paper is merely to contribute a piece of living material to the study of Sufism, in the shape of a true record of certain conversations held by the writer with two Sufis of a very advanced type. And the purpose of the foregoing remarks has been merely to warn the reader that the following narrative is not necessarily to be taken as typical of all Sufism, nor even, for aught we know, of the Sufism of the Rifaite dervishes or dervishes, though one of these two men had been the sheikh or superior 
of a Rifaite monastery in Bulgarian-speaking Turkey. It may, on the contrary, be hazarded that here we have an esoteric Sufism of an extreme type. Only further research can show how far these doctrines are typical of all left-wing Sufism, also how far they are a real part of advanced Rifaism, that is to say, whether they represent an unessential and untypical development of that way, or whether we have here an unveiling of the advanced doctrine of that way, a doctrine of which the lower grades are entirely ignorant, just as, it is said, modern Freemasonry carries its initiates in its highest grades to ideas of which novices, and still more outsiders, have no notion whatever. The strange history of the two brothers, who supplied the writer with this material, cannot be given in detail here. One of them, Muhammad Nasimi, had developed along the line of study and reading rather than through the praxis of mysticism. But the elder brother, Ahmad Kashaf, had been a practicing dervish of an advanced type. It must suffice to say here that they were Sufis and sons of a Sufi that they were disciplined to the way from very childhood, that they entered its novitiate at an early age, and that the elder brother at least passed rapidly through its degrees and stages, so that for years he was head of a Sufi monastery in Turkey, a dervish and the spiritual director of dervishes, and a man widely known in those regions as a saint, and one possessed of a saint's virtues and powers that his levelling mysticism caused him to pass, with his younger brother, beyond Islam altogether, and to seek in some other way a place where the soul is free. Note on the word monastery, more properly fraternity house, for the word monastery suggests celibacy, which has no essential place in Sufism. Residents at Atakia are either unmarried or, if married, are living apart from their wives as long as they reside there. In the course of many conversations with the writer, those reminiscences were communicated. They are far from being complete, still further from being exhaustive. They are even fragmentary. But they are authentic, and possibly their very fragmentariness may suggest the living, personal experience which lay behind them, and thus impart to them an interest and vividness which are often somewhat to seek in more systematized accounts. Note, similarly, we cannot in this article touch upon the missionary aspect of this subject. The relation of Muslim Sufism to Christian evangelism is a subject which calls for a far more complete treatment than it has received. What leads to the mystic life? Sufis are recruited in various ways, for a man is not born, but becomes a Sufi. In the great Al-Ghazali's case, for example, the determining cause was the temporary collapse of his traditional faith and his dissatisfaction with his own moral condition. These two things drove him to search where a credible faith and a personal religious experience could be found, and mysticism supplied both demands. He became, in fact, a dervish. Others, said Sheikh Ahmad, the dervish become Christian who has already been mentioned, enter the Sufi life through disappointment in love. Passion for a woman awakes in them the desire to love Allah, with a love which, having the infinite for its object, will receive real satisfaction. Sometimes this earthly love is lawful, sometimes sinful. It matters not, for in both cases the same longing is aroused which drives to Allah. Sometimes, too, it may be a passionate love for a youth. In Ahmad's case, it was none of these things, but rather the circumstance that he was the son of a Sufi father, and was from infancy trained, as a matter of course, in the Sufistic life. That all this, however, need not necessarily have led to his becoming a professed Sufi, 
is shown by the fact that his younger brother Nasimi developed on rather different lines, as has already been mentioned. Note, the two brothers have always been inseparable. The following study owes almost as much to the one as to the other. Even as children of four years, they were taught to practice the incessant making mention of the name of Allah. They seem never to have played childhood's games. All their lives passed either in study or in mentioning the name of Allah. When the neighbours rebuked the father and said, It is not good for such young children to be given up to these things. He replied, No harm can come from exceeding in the mentioning of Allah. El ifrat fi dikri la. First Steps When a man aspires to enter the profession of regular Sufism, he presents himself to the sheikh or superior of one of the many dervish orders, who examines his spiritual condition and attainments, satisfies himself of his sincerity, and gives him preliminary counsel and advice. You are the corpse, he says, and I the washer of the corpse. You are a garden, I the gardener. He thus undertakes to yield himself wholly and blindly to the spiritual direction of the sheikh, and with him as guide to enter on the mystic way. He enters the monastery and lives a life according to rule, for he needs three things, time, place, brethren, or al-zaman, wal-makan, wal-ikhwan. Some of those preliminary directions are of the following sort. Keep the commands of Allah and abstain from the things prohibited. Leave all that differs from the law and the way. Be constant in religion and keep Allah's covenant, Ahd. In the way and the law become learned. Look not on the faults of others. Supply the needs of the needy with justice and mercy. Leave all evil and blamable ways. Obey the directions and commands of the Sheikh. Tell the truth ever and do not lie. Think of naught but the law, the way, the knowledge and the reality. These four terms have a special significance which we shall see shortly. And thus the aspirant enters on the way of the order he has chosen. In the case of Ahmad, it was the way of the Rifa'iya dervishes, one of the most famous of all the orders. It is a way with sevenfold halts or stages. The Naqshbandi way, for example, has but four stages, and we shall see that the last three of the Rifa'ite seven are but expansions of the fourth. The passing from stage to stage is entirely at the discretion of the superior who judges of the aspirant's aptitude and progress by what he observes of his conduct and experiences. As he confides all to the superior, his dreams, his experiences, his character, his faults, the sheikh is able to judge of his fitness to be, or not to be, promoted to the next stage in the way. The Discipline of a Mystic before entering on an exposition of these seven stages, it will be well here to gather up some of the practice that is common to all, or at least the earlier ones. We have already mentioned the habit of confessing all things to the sheikh. It is this that enables him both to judge of the aspirant's spiritual condition and also to prescribe for him spiritually. The aspirants invariably have dreams, and these the sheikh interprets and judges by them of their state. Note, in this, as in many other curious details, the reader is reminded that the writer is simply setting down what his Sufi informant told him. Sometimes they seem to be fighting with animals. 
This is a sign that they are still in the lower stages before true knowledge has come to the soul. A cat is the sign of hypocrisy, a fox of deceit. Or they see fire or water, and these too have their interpretation. At first the aspirant depends much on the sheikh and calls up his image much at the dhikr, so as to make a way from heart to heart. This is called losing the self in the sheikh, that he may thus have mediated to him the way to losing the self in Allah. In the earlier instructions given by the sheikh, his moral precepts are most detailed and go into the smallest particulars of life. Further, he tells them that hell is now about men and that the Sufistic life is the way whereby they may now and here enter paradise, the jhana of the heart. He describes some of the ecstatic experiences and inflames their desire to know them, the seeing of the coloured lights, ecstasy, self-loss in Allah. The spiritual exercise, riyada, is often very severe, though not all the orders prescribe this severity. Some sheikhs prescribe fasting, little sleep, silence. Sometimes he will prescribe the exceptional or occasional exercise of the 40 days, the retreat. The aspirant is ordered to a tiny cell which is quite dark and which is so small that one can neither stand nor lie at length in it. In this cell he sits for 40 days and 40 nights coming forth only to take part in the spiritual exercises of the community. At night he does not lie down but sleeps as he sits at prayer. His occupation during this retreat is the dhikr. The Dhikr At the prayer of the order on Friday in the mosque of the monastery, the usual Muslim prayer prescribed by the law is first performed. Then the mention follows. The sheikh now comes forward and is the leader. He faces the niche that points to Mecca. Behind him in a row stand the advanced initiates with the standard bearers, holding the standard of the order on their right and left. Behind this row, in a semicircle, stand the aspirants, and in the space between the semicircle and the row are set twelve lighted candles. The sheikh faces round to the worshippers. The advanced initiates and the aspirants prostrate themselves and kiss the floor, and the making mention begins. To describe a mention is wholly impossible here. It has an elaborate ritual, long prayers with innumerable repetitions and refrains. The object is to produce ecstasy. The witness, La ilaha illa Allah, is chanted perhaps three or four hundred times, accelerando to prestissimo, until it may be a rapture is produced. To one thus ecstasized, Fire seems to stream from his mouth, coloured lights fill his vision, he forgets himself and his neighbours, Allah becomes all. This is the entranced state, passion, revelation, ecstasy, losing of the self, union. Note, revelation is the literal meaning, taking away the veil. At such times the ecstatic, in virtue of his state, and invoking the merit of the founder, Ahmad el Rifai, will stab himself with a dagger, and it passes in and out without doing harm. He will handle fire, and the fire loses its heat and does no hurt. If he drinks a deadly thing, it has no effect. Verily, to find the signs promised to believers in Mark's Gospel, in these days it is to the Sufis thou must go. Sikh Sheikh Ahmad Often an excess of ecstasy produces total physical unconsciousness, for the aspirant is lost to the world and is immersed in the spiritual world and in Allah. From this state only the sheikh can, according to his merit, bring him back. This he does by having the rigid body laid before him and addressing to it an awaking charm. 
Thereupon the soul of the aspirant returns to him, and he comes back to himself. The Sevenfold Way With regard to the seven stages into which the way of a dervish in the Rifaite and some other orders is divided, some preliminary considerations must be noticed here. Their origin goes back, of course, far beyond Islam, to Neoplatonism, to Gnosticism, to those common sources of Oriental mysticism, whether Indian or Persian, from which have sprung the various heathen, Jewish, Christian or Mohammedan mysticism, mysteries, Gnosticisms or theosophies from before the Christian era to this day. Their source is, therefore, really one, the dark womb of obliterating Oriental pantheism. But their historical manifestations, with their several adaptations, are bafflingly numerous and intricate. In the adaptation before us, the attempt to use Mohammedan terminology and make as much use of Mohammedan ideas as possible is evident. Traces of Ancient Cosmology or Astrology in the Sevenfold Way The sevenfold journey of the soul at once takes us back to the old cosmology, as old as the Babylonians, and it may be older, as young as Dante, and it may be younger, according to which the Earth, the gross sphere of matter, is encircled by the sevenfold planetary spheres of the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, beyond which are the fixed stars, beyond which again the world of the absolute real. The seven stages of the way are, indeed, actually related to the seven spheres in the Rifaite ritual, but it is only right to say that the old cosmological and astrological significance seems to have been almost entirely lost. Sheikh Ahmad, at least, seemed unable to expound the significance of the various identifications of stage and sphere, though he was aware, of course, that the order of the said stages corresponded to that of the seven planets, according to their proximity to the Earth, as supposed in the pre-Copernican systems. His mental picture of the soul's progress seemed to be not so much an upward flight through the enveloping spheres to the infinite spirit world, beyond the seventh heaven, as an inward journey from the exile of the circumference to the communion at the centre, where the soul rests in reality, the fourth of the four main stages from which the seven have been expanded. Note 4 is also a mystic number, signifying the four corners of the earth, the four elements, and so on. 7 is related to the planet spheres, 12 to the zodiacal signs. These four are the laws, stages 1 and 2, the way, stages 3 and 4, the knowledge, or gnosis, stages 5 and 6, and the reality, stage 7. In the diagram with which he represented these, reality was at the centre, not the circumference. The same Gnostic traits are discernible in the doctrine of the 70,000 veils, to which the reader's attention must for a moment be directed. Traces of Gnosticism in the Sevenfold Way 70,000 veils separate Allah, the one reality, from the world of matter and of sense. And every soul passes before his birth through these 70,000. The inner half of these are veils of light, the outer half veils of darkness. For every one of the veils of light passed through in this journey towards birth, the soul puts off a divine quality and for every one of the dark veils, it puts on an earthly quality. Thus the child is born weeping, for the soul knows its separation from Allah, the one reality. And when the child cries in its sleep, it is because the soul remembers something of what it has lost. Otherwise the passage through the veils has brought with it forgetfulness, and for this reason man is called insan, 
which rhymes with it in Arabic. He is now, as it were, in prison in his body, separated by these thick curtains from Allah. But the whole purpose of Sufism, the way of the dervish, is to give to him an escape from this prison, an apocalypse of the 70,000 veils, a recovery of the original unity with the One while still in this body. The body is not to be put off, it is to be refined. Talataf, the original meaning of Latif, fine. And it is to be made spiritual, a help and not a hindrance to the spirit. It is like a metal that has to be refined by fire and transmuted. And the sheikh tells the aspirant that he has the secret of this transmutation. We shall throw you into the fire of spiritual passion, ushk, he says, and you will emerge refined. And the fuel that feeds that flame is the dhikr. We have already said that the dhikr originally means simply the mentioning or the commemorating the name of God. Hence the multifold ecstatic repetition of the same at the surfaces of the Sufis, and hence those services themselves. For every stage traversed in this return journey to Allah, then, ten thousand of the veils are apocalyptic or kashf. Early Experiences of the Mystic But the aspirant has been warned that these early stages are the stages where patience is above all necessary, for these are the dark veils. The stages of the law are verily a husk, a bitter husk that has to be broken through. It is the stage of repentance. It was at this stage of the law that the Banu Israel, the Israelites, slew themselves for very repentance and died. So too must the aspirant die, die many times daily, the death of this bitterness. This death the Sufis call the death before death or the lesser nirvana. If he is not willing to die this death, he cannot be born again. But if he is willing, his body becomes progressively refined. The light begins to come through at the time of the dhikr and rapture. This new unknown experience astounds the aspirant. If Allah dwells in his heart now, he thinks he is Allah. But this thought is premature. He is only looking within. He has reached the world of uniting, but there is a higher stage yet. The intermediary stage is not final, for he is only looking within. And after the state of ecstasy is over, he must return to the world and break up that union and that unity. He does not yet see Allah in all things, and all things related to himself. That is the true goal. It is owing to the weakness and agitation of the immediate stages that he often faints and loses consciousness at the dhikr. Therefore, the truly advanced consider these manifestations as signs of weakness signs of incompleteness, and of still imperfect attainment. We may now consider the seven stages in detail. They correspond to seven states of the soul, or more accurately, to the seven kinds, Tawr, Atwa, of soul, the Sufis' seven ages of man. For the sake of clearness, they may be at once named 1. The soul depraved El Nafsul Amara, two the soul accusatory, El Nafsul Lawama, three the soul inspired, El Nafsul Mulhama, four the soul tranquil, El Nafsul Mutmaina, five the soul God satisfied, El Nafsul Radia, six the soul God satisfying, El Nafsul Madia and seven, the soul clarified, perfect, El Nafsul Safiya Wal Kamila.
This podcast is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.